All right. Good morning, everybody. This is the 11th episode of Web's Webinar Wednesday. Um, funny thing, because it's in the afternoon in the Netherlands, and normally you used to log in or to tune in on Web's Webinar Wednesday on Wednesday morning. So we even had some people of you who were joining us via the link this morning. But we have a very good reason for that, that it's in the afternoon right now, because we got our friend Luke Sommerfield over from HubSpot, who will join us today. Um, as said in the chat page, he is located in San Diego, so it's 7 a.m. in the morning for him over there. So good that he joins. His, his, he has his coffee to wake up his brain, so that's good. Um, and some funny things are, are, are going on here, because this is Look At Me in Inbound 2018 in Boston. So almost two years ago, at the same summer as, as right now, we were meeting in person at that great HubSpot event all the way in Boston, USA. But the funny thing is, this year, Inbound 2020 will be on remote. Since all the stuff around COVID-19, we need to, of course, respect each other's health, which is the most important thing in the world, but we can't meet in person this year. So it even um, uh, underlines how important it is to organize all your things around your business on remote, digitally, when face-to-face -face meetings are not going uh, through, when trade shows are canceled. So of course, now we are hosting these webinars together with Luke today. So very happy that he will uh, uh, join us today. We are going to talk about how to get a ridiculously well-performing website. But before we hand over to Luke, we have some rules for this webinar. If you're joining for the first time, I will explain it to you. Um, as you notice, you're all muted. So um, you can use the chat pane as you already did. A lot of you were notifying themselves, so that's cool. Please, if you have any questions, don't wait till the end, don't wait till tomorrow. Drop it right now in the chat. Keep them coming, keep them coming. Even I and Luke, we all together will manage the chat pane in order to get all your answers answered. If we skip a question or if there's anything missed in this webinar, you will get a direct link to our calendars right after this webinar. So you can even schedule some one-to-one -one time with either me or Luke to talk about the HubSpot CMS and um, yeah, your website and all your challenges you are facing there. So that's enough from my end for now. We hand over to Luke, so I will stop sharing my screen. I'm very happy that he will be here, that he is here joining us today. So Luke, over to you, my friend. All right, thank you so much. And, um, and welcome everyone. I am really happy to have you spending your afternoon with me. And um, as mentioned, I have two screens. I got one up with just the chat pane and one up with my slides. So I'll have an eye on the chat pane and we can make this a conversation um, versus me just presenting. So open that up, make sure you use it, say hi. Um, but this was me last night uh, preparing for this presentation. And you know, just much like many of us do the night before a presentation, you're making last minute changes and I was doing research and I stumbled on the most remarkable thing, just the craziest thing, my friends. Does anyone know what this is? Let me know in the chat pane. What is this thing? This is what I found last night when I was doing research for this presentation. A CD, CD, compact disc, Frisbee. Yes, I mean, these days it probably is a Frisbee. Um, it's remarkable. This is a CD or what they called a, back in the day, a CD-ROM. And the remarkable thing about the CDs is that you almost had to treat them kind of like your your children. You had to take good care of them, put them in safe places. If they got, you know, treated poorly, maybe they stopped working. And the other remarkable thing was this was like the standard for delivering software in the 90s. The Microsoft 95 team would go work on Windows 95. They'd spend all this time. They'd release it. And then they go back into the kind of dungeons of the uh, Microsoft Office and start coding Microsoft 98. And that was like the next time that we saw a leap in software progress. But interesting enough, as that was going on, there were three forces that were shifting 
behind the scenes that totally revolutionized how software was built. The first one was technology. Servers were getting cheaper, computing was getting faster. It was a lot easier to um, run software um, in the cloud. Secondly was the process that informed how people went about building peak performing software. And the third was because of the technology shift, because of the process shift, it changed the way that companies thought about how they build a software business and leveraging that software to grow their business. And all three of these things came together to form some magic. It was the SaaS revolution, my friends, from the 90s, where we went from this world of CD-ROMs being the standard delivery mechanism to a world where it lived online. And there was a number of companies that didn't make this transition. They just couldn't shift the company. There was companies that made that transition. And of course, we're, we're on Zoom today. There are uh, software companies that were just a conversation back in the CD-ROM days that started in SaaS and now are the biggest companies in the world. And so you may be asking yourself, Luke, what does this have anything? We're here to talk about websites. What does this have to do with websites? Well, my friends, today I'm here to tell you that the world of web design is shifting. And it's shifting in those same three fundamental shifts, technology, process, and culture. And that's what we're going to talk about over the next maybe 35, 40 minutes are those shifts. Um, we're not going to get too deep into the tactics because I think what's important, the takeaway for you today is to think about where the world of web is going and how you as a company can adapt to that new window of opportunity. Take advantage of it to grow your company um, and think about it differently. I will give some takeaways for um, some homework items. Um, they're a bit more tactical. And of course, we can do question and answer along the way. Let's dive in, starting with looking at the culture. How is the culture of web design shifting? So let me know in the chat pane, why does your business have a website? What is the purpose of the website in your company? Why do you have one? Or should we delete them? Are they not that important? Inform people, new colleagues. Dustin says converting leads. Pascal, branding, generate leads, lead gen generate leads. So there's some, some level of awareness, some level of lead generation, tying it back to the business. And what we see is that if we look at the traditional culture, how does a company traditionally think about their website as a tool? Traditionally, the culture views the website very much like a business expense. It's sort of this necessary evil that you, you kind of have to go through, you have to invest in. It's just part of doing business. Now, some of you who are thinking in the, in the terms of lead generation, in terms of awareness, in terms of building a brand and a community, you're thinking about it very similar to how modern companies think about it. When we look at the Slacks, the Ubers, the Facebooks, the HubSpots of the world, how do they think about their website? They've created a different culture around how they use the website to grow their business. They think of it more as a growth investment. And so just like you personally have investments that you're investing into on a regular basis, company has an investment. They think about the website that as I put effort into it, as I grow it, it will help accelerate the flywheel of my business. It'll help generate leads. And so it's a very different, subtle, but very different mindset from a necessary evil to we're going to invest and it's going to help grow our business. Secondly, traditional culture very much sees the website as a digital brochure. Maybe there was some digital asset, a PDF, that got turned into the website. It's very static, very informational, um, and that's okay. But we need to take it further in this day and age. Modern culture around companies think of their website like a product in their product line. So just like you have products and services that you sell, that you have a product team actively working on, actively improving. You have product managers, you have engineers or tech leads, you have designers. They're always thinking about how do we improve this product or service to deliver more value to our customers. We think of the website as one of those products. And maybe it's a free product. Maybe it's, a, it's free, it's interactive, um, but maybe it's a paid product. We're seeing more and more in this day and age that the website can become its own paid product with online academies, with premium content, with uh, member login areas and member subscriptions. 
Um, these are all ways that you can think about generating revenue directly from your website and treating it like a product. And it's also a product that has wide sweeping impact. What I mean by that is that from the chat pane, again, we're all marketers here. So we kind of have our little marketer blinders on. We think of the website as a tool to help generate leads, generate visitors and awareness, which it is. And that's probably the primary focus at this point. But modern companies are thinking about how do we expand the impact across other departments that the website can have? How might we help the sales team, the HR team, uh, the recruiting team, the customer service team get to their goals faster, leveraging the website as a tool? We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Lastly, traditional culture very much is built on an assumption-based culture. What looks pretty? What does the CEO think that we should do? What button color does the CEO think we should put here? And so there's a lot of assumptions on what we should build onto the site. And the problem with assumptions is that you put yourself at risk. You do this big launch, you launch the thing out, and then it doesn't perform the way that you think. And so just like we were talking about a lot in performance marketing, with the website, we are taking a data-driven approach where we have a deep understanding of the audience, how they interact with the site. And the beauty is in this day and age, it's easier than ever to get that um, behavioral um, analytics on how people are interacting with your site to make those more informed decisions. Something that wasn't possible years ago in the traditional culture world. So my friends, my call to action to you today is to reject the traditional culture, to start thinking about building a modern culture around how you think about your website as a tool to grow the business. Now, this is where at the end of each one of these, we're going to give you some tactics on, um, for those of you who are maybe on the ground doing the execution work, how might you get started with this today? To start your culture shift, the first thing you can do, again, is make sure that you have the data available to you so that you can make those more informed decisions. Two tools that um, we love at HubSpot, we use, uh, they're app partners of ours, you can use them with or without HubSpot, it doesn't matter if you're a HubSpot customer or not. The first one is Hotjar, and the second one is Lucky Orange. Very similar tools, um, have different plans and features depending on what you need. But work to um, install those behavioral research tools so that you can understand how people are interacting um, and how people are, um, what they're interested in, what they're not so interested in. Now, this, the little note here is if you're a HubSpot customer, we have um, one-click integrations with each one of these tools. So you can go into our app marketplace and connect these tools to your CRM, to your marketing tools, so that that rich behavioral data gets pulled from that kind of anonymous data gets pulled into your contact records, and then you can trigger all your automation and everything off of that. The second is thinking about, get with your department heads, get with other people in the company and ask yourselves, how might we leverage the website to help other parts of the company grow? And that's really that takeaway that I talked about, that the website should impact more than just marketing. How do we think about the flywheel in each one of these pieces where, of course, we're attracting visitors, we're converting leads, but could we use the customer or the website as a tool to build educational centers, whether that's free or paid, to help impact retention, to help impact activation, helps our services team to get rolling? How might we use the website to help build more rich sales enablement, more rich sales tools. We've done this at HubSpot. We have a tool called websitegrader.com. And if you go to websitegrader.com, it's a free tool that does an audit on your website, tells you what you're doing well and not so well on. And it's a tool that lives on the website and is used by the sales reps during conversations so that they can have kind of a talk track on what they want to talk about with prospects. They can run a report on the prospect site and have a conversation about it. How might you build tools like that on your website for your sales reps? What about new customer onboarding? Someone signs up. Do they have a very smooth onboarding flow to get them started, get them seeing value in your products and services? How might you use the website to build that onboarding flow? Um, again, you can have customer dashboards, advocate programs. Uh, the ideas go on and on and on. But what the point here is, my friends, is to think about how you might use the website with other departments to help them get to their goals and deliver value along other parts of the customer journey outside of just attracting and converting leads. 
Let's move on to the second shift that we're seeing in the web world. And this is process. How do you go about building a peak performing website? Well, traditionally, the process is very much a business focused type of a strategy. It's very much a me, 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 me. Why are we the best? Why are we better than our competitors? Buy my product. And what we're seeing is that a lot of times your, your end customers don't really care about your company. I'm sorry, that's, that's a, it's a truth. They don't care about your company. What they care about is what your company helps them make a change in their life for the better. And so modern companies take that step back and they meet the customers where they're at and have a customer focused strategy where you gain an empathetic understanding of the world that your customers live in first, then build a website that helps them in that journey to get them to the outcomes they want faster, cheaper, easier, better than they are today. Right? So it's a subtle shift, my friends. It goes from the traditional culture of we're gonna, or the traditional process where we're gonna build this site about ourselves and we're gonna throw it at the customer, hopefully something sticks, to no, like we're not even gonna think about ourselves, we're gonna think about our website. Let's just learn about our customer's life and their world and then weave it in as a part of their journey. Again, it's subtle, but very important to think about when you go about building the strategy around your website. Now, eventually it gets uh, time to build the site. You get through the strategy and it's time to actually build it. Um, I'm curious, how many people have gone through a website redesign? And if you have, let me know in the chat pane, what emotions did you experience during this journey? During this three, six, nine month long journey, what emotions did you experience during your website, previous website redesigns? Let me know in the chat pane. Frustration from Joss. Currently developing a client portal. How are you feeling about that part? Is it going well? Is it not going well? Frustration, TG, frustration, stress sometimes, happiness. Yeah, something new. Hopefully helps build a new face to the company, a new uh, lead generation. Well, we asked this question um, to marketers at, at HubSpot and we were curious. And here's what we got back. Let me, let me simplify this a little bit so it's a little easier to read. People were excited. There was hope. They were proud. They had pride. This was something new, different, a big change in the company. But more so, what we heard here in the chat pane as well, is frustration, overwhelm, stress, anxiety. And my favorite one out of all this is this little one, which is vacation. Like, just get me out of here. I need to go to a beach with a cocktail and just relax for a little bit. And the reason that this happens is that Inevitably, the traditional process almost always goes over budget or gets delivered late, right? Kenny says endless. It's the end, never ending process. You finally get the site done three, six, nine months later, and it's already out of date. It's the never ending process. And so what we see is that the reason these happens is because we're using a broken playbook. We're setting ourselves up for failure before it starts by using this traditional process. It's a huge project, goes over budget, gets delivered late, it's already out of date, what we see modern companies doing is they think about their website uh, in phases and they start with a launch pad site, what they call a launch pad site. What this means is it's a site that looks and performs better than what you have today, but is a, a starting point, a lightweight starting point to get you started, start collecting data and make more informed decisions on how to improve. Now, eventually, hopefully the website goes live and What's interesting is that although many of us are here to learn about our website, we find out that marketers actually only make impactful, big improvements to the site about once a year. You know, not, not marketing, not blogging. Of course, we're doing blogging if, you, if you're doing an inbound strategy, but impactful improvements to the core site about once a year get in there and make changes. And so the funny thing is, is that you typically looks like this, this traditional process. You have a site. It sits for about a year and a half to two years. It becomes so outdated, performs so poorly that we have to embark in this six month redesign process where we're frustrated, we're overwhelmed. And then we launch the site and we're kind of like, all right, let's put that to the side and move on to other things. And the funny thing is that, does, what does this look like? This looks like the software development cycle of the 90s. And so we, my friends in the web world, unfortunately are still living in the 90s, but it's time for us to think differently. And the way we think differently uh, uh, is the last part of this is the traditional process is also very much a set and forget. You get the thing done, you're kind of move on to other things. It becomes, starts to become stale. It starts to become, you know, kind of decay in terms of the look, the feel, the performance. 
But modern companies, again, thinking about their website as a product, they always are looking at how might we improve the website like a product. They're doing continuous improvements. And we're going to dive into this topic a little bit more in detail um, because I want to leave you with um, two things. One, a rhythm and one focus. How do we think about the rhythm that we need to create, the momentum we need to create in our in continuous improvement efforts? Let's look at that one first. Um, before we dive into this, if it feels like I'm going quickly, it's because I have a lot of content to cover. And I know that um, English for probably most of you is a second language. So keep in mind, we are recording this. And I'll give you a link for a free certification that HubSpot's created that goes into this in much more detail. So um, you're not going to miss anything. We'll get you a deeper dive on this and we'll get you recording so you can get up to speed. So the way we think about rhythm is that you have a quarterly rhythm and you have a monthly rhythm and then you have a two week rhythm. The quarterly rhythm is we host something called the quarterly summit. Every quarter we take a step back and you can think of this as the captain of the ship. Where do we need to direct the ship based off of what's happened and where we wanna go? So it's your time to step out of execution and think about how are we gonna redirect the, shift, the, the ship. Out of that quarterly summit, the takeaway here is what is the theme for the quarter? Where are we directing the ship for that quarter. And I'll, I'll tell you in a second what those themes are, what the options are. Once you've set that theme, you can then jump down into execution mode, right? And this is broken into a month by month, month one, two, three. And in each month, you run a two week sprint cycle. The way growth driven design works is for, for some of you who may uh, be familiar with Agile, it's all built off of an Agile foundation. And the way Agile and the way the growth driven design works is that we have a list of high impact action items. All the amazing things that we can do that will impact our goals and fit within the theme of the quarter. And we'll prioritize that list and pick off the top uh, items off our wish list to implement during that two week sprint cycle. We'll jump back, we'll reprioritize, and we go from there. Now, that's the rhythm quarterly rhythm, monthly rhythm, every two week rhythm. Now the question is, is like, where do we focus our time? That's one of the things that we talk about in modern, modern um, processes. We have limited time and resources, my friends. There's only so many hours in the day. And so it's very important that we are smart about where we invest our time to generate the results that we need. And so there are, there are, in an effort to help us be able to focus our time and energy, I built something called the Website Performance Roadmap. This is a framework for those of you who are in um, product management, who are in strategy, to be able to be more effective in how you uh, prioritize your time. The Website Performance Roadmap starts with the themes. The first theme is establish. Establish means what do we need to do to continue to build the core foundational pieces of the site that are going to deliver value? The second theme is optimize. How do we, instead of building net new things, how do we look at what we have and make it better? And the third theme is how do we expand the impact that the website is having on our customers and on our business? Okay, so every quarter when you meet, you're going to pick one of those three themes and the theme is going to be determined on the life cycle of the website, kind of usually when it gets launched, you start focusing in that established theme. Maybe the first month or two after it, you're in the established theme. The second uh, few months, you're in optimize. And then eventually, once things are optimized, you'll hit an area of diminishing returns in terms of effort to results. And then you can look at expanding the website. And then it kind of is fluid. It will start back over. Within each one of these themes, as we see here, there are... Um, you can think of these as ingredients, ingredients to a recipe. And the ingredients to the recipe allow your team to prioritize that wish list. So you could say, for this month, are we going to harvest the low hanging fruit? I don't know if that's an a idiom or a saying in, in the Netherlands, but in the US we say harvest the low hanging fruit. It basically means there's probably some very obvious, very glaring things that we need to do to build the site, and let's prioritize those. Um, and work on them. A lot of times, right after the site launches, this is where you spend your time. It's all those things that you wanted to build onto the initial launchpad site that didn't get in there right away the first month you start building those things in. From there, audience. 
are you getting a consistent flow of new visitors to the site? Of course, you need new visitors in order to collect data. Um, okay, good. It says, Josh says, low-hanging fruit is, is a saying there. Good. Um, and lastly, in Establish, you, you gut check yourself and you make sure that the things that you've built onto the website are actually providing value to the visitors, to your customers that are coming to the site, right? Or if they don't care about it, if you've maybe missed the mark and it's not something that's helping provide value to them, this is the time to change that and make sure that the site is providing value. Eventually, again, you move into the optimize. There's three areas that you could focus on with optimize. Do you improve the usability of the site? Do you make it easier, faster for them to achieve that value, find that value, unlock that value that the website brings? Then you can move into conversion rate optimization or CRO for short. And everyone's got their own little definition of CRO. The way I think of it is that on the website, you have paths, you have funnels, that your visitors go through, that your customers go through. And during this time, what we wanna do is find ways to reduce friction and steps in that funnel so that they get from point A to point B as fast and as efficient as possible. So this is a time we'll focus on that. And then lastly, you work to personalize the site. We know that personalization is more important than ever, the experience that someone gets. And so you can spend some time personalizing the experience that someone has when they land on the site so that you don't have this one size fits none approach. And eventually you, you kind of hit a wall, you've optimized everything, you need to move on and you can start thinking about how do we expand the impact? How do we build new digital products onto the site that deliver more value? That websitegrader.com is a good example. That's a digital product that lives on our website that we built. Helps provide value to the customers, helps our sales team have conversations, generates leads for the business. How do we expand into other parts of the journey? This is where we talked about, you could start building onboarding processes, you could start building career um, recruitment funnels and career sites, you could start building um, assets onto the site to lower the number of support calls, lower the number of support tickets, building knowledge bases. And then lastly, teams, how might you use this to impact other teams in the business, right? So this is again, where you expand the website. So this is a framework that you can use as you think about each month, each quarter, how are we going to prioritize our wish list and our time um, in order to build that peak performing website in continuous improvement. So if that seems like a lot, my friends, um, it is, but uh, it allows us to be able to do something like this, to go from this set it and forget it to approach to a month over month improvement in the site over time and of course, your marketing and sales lives as a layer on top of this. You really need all three of those elements working together. You know, we try to think of them as distinct pieces of a puzzle, but in reality, it's all the same customer journey. It all is working towards the same goals. And so you really need those three things working in harmony. If this seems like a lot, um, we've built a free certification. What we've done is we've kind of packaged these ideas into our own methodology called Growth Driven Design. And Growth Driven Design is the new playbook for building those peak performing websites. And what we did was we ta talked about in 2017, I spent some time teaching a lot of agencies growth driven design, webs being one of them. Um, and they embraced it a lot. Of, we had over a thousand agencies in 50 countries use it. And I asked them, how is growth driven design impacting the websites they're building? What we found was that those same agencies were using the growth driven design methodology and launching in under 60 days, launching on time and improving with real data. This is based off of a survey of 350 agencies. Traditional, that same agency doing a traditional process with the client launched in 108 days, two weeks late, and then set it and forget it. And at the end of the day, what really matters here is, as we talked about in the chat pane, the purpose of your website for us as marketers is to help generate leads. We found that those agencies saw 16.9% more leads and 11.2% more revenue six months after the website launched when they use growth driven design versus traditional design. So if that's the goal, my friends, um, it's pretty clear that this new way of working, this smarter approach is the one that uh, fits best for the business that wants to do this. So how do we get started in this? These are the tactics you could take away today. Again, to get that empathetic understanding, it's important that uh, you talk to your customers. Find 10 customers that recently purchased from your company, last 30 days they've purchased, and then 10 customers or ex-customers who recently left your company in the last 30 days, and interview them to find out why they made that switch. That switch is really important. That switch 
is where you base your messaging. It's where you inform what types of testimonials you need to create, what anxieties are they finding. And we've built a template to help you run these user interviews and learn a little bit more about how to think about this at this bit.ly link. Again, we'll send this out after, um, but you'll get all the details there. This uses a framework that's used by many Silicon Valley companies now and, and others in the design world called the Jobs to be Done framework. Um, and this is kind of the step that you can take. Um, next, we talked about it, websitegrader.com. You can run your website through there, get a free report on what's working well, what's not working well, and that will help you prioritize your wish list over the next couple weeks on areas that you can improve your site. So you can use that. Uh, you can also, uh, based off of your goals, you can identify the three highest impact pages and then use those behavior data um, information that we had on there um, the hot jar, the lucky orange, to ask what brought you here today? To find out why people are visiting your site, what value are they looking to unlock, what problem are they trying to solve, and then use that to improve the site. Typically, the best place to start your testings is using something called a, um, your messaging. And your messaging is the story that you tell on a page. That's where you're gonna see the biggest impact. That's where you're gonna see the, um, when you run A-B tests, it's gonna be the, the first place you wanna start, especially if you have low traffic, is around your messaging. And so there's a framework called the Brand Script by a company called StoryBrand. They have a great book um, you can read called StoryBrand that teaches you how to talk about your messaging. Um, and so when you look at what brought people there today and you look at making an experiment, running an experiment, you can use that StoryBrand script to change the, um, change the messaging on the site and experiment. Again, talked about a free certification. You can go to growthdrivendesign.com to get access to that free certification. Learn more about how to set this up, get tools, templates, everything you need to get started with Growth Driven Design. All right, this brings us to the last part of this, which is uh, the shift that's happening in technology. And I know we're running on time, so I'm gonna go a little quicker so that we leave some time for questions. Again, you can always ask in the chat pane as well. So what's happening in the world of um, technology? Well, the first place that I wanna focus is around content management systems. These are the tools that you use to build your website on. I have a question in the chat pane. What's the most frustrating thing about using your content management system or CMS? What have you found as you need to build the site, improve the site, what's been the most frustrating thing for you as a marketing team? Let me know. Need for a developer most of the times, right? There's someone who it's such a technical, complicated system. You need a developer to make any changes. Different languages, right? I know in Europe, you almost inevitably always have different languages. Flexibility to build landing pages and I assume website pages as well quickly. Crashing plugins, constantly updating. Costs of the time. Yeah, that's the thing is like, the time is your most valuable resource, my friends, and it's, uh, it's important to consider that in the costs of running your website, not just the actual physical monetary costs. Limitations, data tracking, not flexible. Well, we've heard a lot of these things, and what's, what's interesting is it came down to, you know, it kind of gets boiled down to an interesting quote by this professor at NYU, Clay Shirky. He says, technology doesn't get truly interesting until it becomes almost invisible. As technology gets more advanced, the level of sophistication gets bigger, but it should be easier and easier to manage. You think of the Google, the Alexa, the Zoom, very, very easy. You almost forget that the technology is even there. And that's where we're seeing this disruption of these old, hard to use experiences being disrupted by this easy, lightweight, good experiences. But if that's the case, my friends, we have gotten content management systems all wrong. As the business grows, it demands more out of the website. You have to layer in more things, more plugins, more attribution reporting, lead conversion, uh, SEO tools, uh, security. You're layering in all this stuff and you build this very bulky system. It's very hard to all those challenges that we talked about earlier, constantly updating, plugins crashing, needing a developer or external party to do any of the work. It's a sim those are all symptoms of this problem. And so what we see is traditional websites force you to focus on the system. It forces you into a heavy maintenance, heavy updates, and low security. You're having to layer in security. And if any of those plugins, if any of those things go um, out of date, it opens you to these vulnerabilities. 70,000 hacks happen a day. And that's a risk for your business. 
but it's also not only from the website going down and losing business opportunity, but it's also a legal risk if data gets scraped or pulled and all of a sudden you have a lot of problems. Modern CMSs are built on a SaaS infrastructure. So just like all the other software in the entire world is built on SaaS, for some reason in the CMS market, we haven't made that shift. We're still in this kind of legacy model of having to maintain servers, having to maintain update and update things, having to layer in security. Modern CMSs, and again, this is not exclusive to HubSpot. Um, there's Shopify is on a SaaS framework, Wix, Squarespace. If you look at all of these CMSs that are up and coming, they're all built on the SaaS infrastructure. What that means is that they just take care of all that stuff for you. They take care of the maintenance, they take care of the updates, they take care of the security so that you can shift your time away from your systems and focus on your customers, which again, your time is your most valuable asset. The second thing I saw it in the chat pane is gatekeepers. Because these systems get so complex, it requires you to have to use a developer to make any kind of a change. And so that's bad for a few reasons. One, it slows your team's time down. It hard, it's very hard to be agile, very hard to be quick, hard to do things like growth-driven design and modern processes because your developers in another sprint cycle, maybe six weeks later, you can get them to prioritize it or your agencies, um, you know, again, in another sprint cycle, it's very, very difficult to get things done quickly. And for the developers in the room, it's very, it's very um, frustrating because they don't want to be spending their precious time and energy updating button colors, adding images, um, changing menu items. All that stuff should be done by the teams doing the work, which frees the developers' time up to work on more impactful things. Modern CMSs, whether it's HubSpot or others, when you're evaluating CMSs, you want to look for a CMS that allows you to enable your marketing team to just get their work done to build a user experience for that marketing team where they can get the work done that they need, changing button colors, updating things, whatever it is, working on conversion optimization, personalization, all those things that we talked about with growth driven design. And it frees the developer time up to work on more impactful experiences, building those digital products, those tools, those onboarding flows, the payment processing systems, the things that are gonna really drive value to the company. The last two, which I'll go over quickly, um, is a symptom of the CMS living kind of in its own world. So if it lives, if the system of the CMS, the, the interaction, the system of content for your company lives in its own world, it's not communicating with your CRM, with the data that you have. And so it creates this one size fits none experience for customers. The experience a visitor, first time visitor gets is the exact same as the experience that a lifelong customer that a dealer versus direct, that a lead or a prospect gets, it's all the same experience. Modern CMSs are coupled together with your CRM so that you have all that rich data at your fingertips to easily personalize and build powerful personalized experiences for your visitors. In addition, because it's coupled, uh, or because traditional CMSs are not coupled, you have very fuzzy reporting. It's very tough to see the impact that your investments to the website make. And that's tough because it's hard for your marketing team to make smarter decisions on where to invest your time if you don't have that data at your fingertips. Um, and I saw that come up in the chat pane a couple times that uh, from Francis, he says data tracking, very important. Modern CMSs, again, because they're coupled with your CRM, you, ha you have a very clear view on the effort you're putting in and what pages are impacting lead generation, impacting revenue and where you should invest your time. And it makes it very easy to report to your CMO, to your CEO of the investments you're making in your website and the impact they're having on the business. So if all of this sounds interesting, none of this is related to HubSpot, but what we saw at HubSpot is we saw all of these shifts, the technology shift, the culture shift, the process shift. We saw what was changing and we launched on April 7th, a new hub, CMS hub, that takes care of all of these things we've been talking about, building modern websites. What we did is we looked at bringing down the power and the personalization tools from enterprise CMSs, these monster CMSs that cost hundreds and thousands of euros, bring that power down, but at the same time, make it very, very easy to build a site for a marketer. We brought up all the good things, the editing experience that we see in the Wixes and the Squarespaces and in the website builders. So you have the best of both worlds. You don't have to make any trade-offs. So for those of you, I know we have a number of HubSpot customers in here. If you're interested, 
CMS Hub Professional, we have two tiers. The first one is CMS Hub Professional. This is for fast growing companies who are tired of being held back by clunky content management systems that require heavy maintenance and make it difficult for marketers to get their work done. The three ways that we make that happen is first, maintenance and management without the migraines. What that means is that's that SaaS CMS story. Um, you get a CDN, you get 99.99% uptime, 24 hour security monitoring. We literally have not only machine learning and AI, but also physical people monitoring all of our sites at any given time and getting the sites back online so you don't have to wake up at two in the morning. Um, standard SSL, web application firewall, all of those types of things. Um, the second way that we make this happen is we make it easy to build and optimize remarkable website pages. And that's both for the marketer and for the developer. I'll show you an example of that um, in right now. Um, the way we look, look at this for the marketers, we wanna build an editing experience that enables them to get their work done, to build and optimize pages without ever having to touch code. We have a theme editor to change the look, the feel, the colors, the fonts, without ever having to touch CSS. You have a panel um, that you can do that all on. Now the beauty is, um, this editing experience is determined by the developer. So the developer can say, what experience is our team need to be able to do this work? Let's set that up. Um, you know, you're able to get them done, but then let's set some guardrails on what they can't access, right? Because you want to give away the keys to the kingdom. It's really easy to break things. Um, it's really easy to, to cause confusion. And so the, the developers set up the develop the marketers editing experience. What are the knobs and dials and the things that are available so that they can get their work done, but still be able to kind of structure things and make sure that there's some limitations to make sure that uh, the website moves forward. The second thing that we have in here is drag and drop editing experience. This is, makes it very easy for marketers to move things, add new modules, add columns, add rows, make images bigger, smaller, text bigger, smaller, um, very, very easy editing experience. Now for the developers on the other side, we have, um, they want the opposite experience. They want pure code. And so we have a local development CLI that will allow them to build all the, um, websites locally on their machine, just like how they normally like to work using their own editors, frameworks, processors, workflows that they already know and love. And they can simply keep using that and just plug in HubSpot CMS um, and be able, or CMS Hub and be able to go from there. And so this is the editing experience for a developer. And the last part of that is the last story um, that we have with CMS Hub Professionals. It's an all-in-one tool to help grow traffic and generate leads. So not only do you get the CR CMS, but it comes with our CRM coupled together. Um, and so all of your data on your customers is at your fingertips for your marketing team and for your developers to take action on and do that personalization, to do that um, unique experiences. It also has right out of the box SEO recommendations tools, search engine console, uh, conversational platform with live chat bots, uh, live chat and bots, A-B testing and contact attribution reporting. All built in right out of the box, no need to add anything in. The second tier that we have is for enterprise companies. And it comes with everything that we just talked about because those enterprise companies, um, those larger upper mid market companies are still struggling with those gatekeepers and struggling with the, the maintenance and security. But it also gives those organizations the opportunity to build powerful web app experiences and provides more governance and control to their growing team. The three ways we allow that are first, Again, you can build these powerful web app experiences, things like quoting calculators. Here's a calculator built by one of our customers, ClassPass. They're like a, um, a gym uh, membership uh, company. They're very, very large, over a billion dollar valuation, and they use it on the B2B side of their business um, to help generate leads. Uh, this is an example, again, of a digital product that was built. It could be a event registration system where you list all your upcoming events, people can register for it. Again, it's all tied into all the other HubSpot tools with the automation, with the CRM, um, and then this is the visual experience that the visitors get on the front end of the website. The second one is governance and control at scale. So as you have new business units, as you have new ventures, new teams, you need your IT and security team need to be happy with the structure um, and the tooling so that it's scalable, reliable, and secure. And so these are a lot of features that maybe as marketers aren't the most sexy, but are very important for a scaling uh, organization and for the security and IT teams to give you the thumbs up to be able to build uh, a scalable solution. Things like content partitioning, 
user and team permissions, activity login, um, activity monitoring, uh, custom CDN configurations, things like that. And lastly, the ability to extend your brand as you expand into new areas, as you launch new ventures, new business units, new events, you may have a need for more websites. And so you can easily spin up, um, here's an example of a micro site built by Calm. They're a meditation app in the Google Store, uh, Google and apps, um, Apple Store, one of the top apps downloaded, where they use um, the CMS Hub for their B2B side of their business. Build a, uh, a microsite for one of their initiatives that they're running. Now, it's not just me that's interested in uh, and excited about CMS Hub. Of course, I'm biased, but um, it's other people in the world too. If you look at G2 Crowd or G2, they're like the Yelp of software. Um, 2019 and 2020, CMS Hub ranked number one out of all CMSs on the market. So you can go there and you can read about it. Uh, we also have a lot of publicly traded companies. Um, I'm sure some of these are in Netherlands area, maybe some are not. Companies like ClassPass, DoorDash, Randstad, Coca-Cola, um, ClassPass, World Wildlife Fund. And if you're interested in seeing what sites look like on CMS Hub, you can go to inspire.hubspot.com. That's a gallery. Uh, we just launched that in April, but I think we have about 200 entries right now of all the beautiful things. I know Web, Webs has a number of entries in there that you can check out the types of websites that were built. All right, my friends. So those are the three shifts. Um, that I wanted to talk about today, the technology shift, the process shift, and the culture shift. These are important whether or not it has nothing to do with tooling. Um, it's more about just shifts you need to recognize and shifts you need to make in your business to open that door of opportunity for growth. Um, and the best part of it is that we have your back, both from the technology standpoint of CMS Hub, from a process standpoint of growth design, and from a culture and strategy perspective, Webs is here to help you. You'll get the link again for any consultations or any questions, you can always meet with them and, and learn a little bit more as well. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions. So yes. we can turn it over and do, um, we'll do a couple. If we can stay a minute or two later too, um, I'm happy to stay. I think I got, uh, I think I'm free for a few minutes. Oh, cool, cool. Thank you for your energy. I, I think only my one-year-old daughter has so much energy at seven <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> well, it's a message that it's a message that I've you know, someone who's been in the industry now for uh, going on fourteen years and lived at an agency before HubSpot, worked here. Like I felt these pains, and uh, so I'm very passionate about solving those pains. Yeah. Um, you know, I can imagine it's really impressive how, impressive how it's built up from the outside in perspective from a user perspective how to generate growth with this cool tool um we have some questions uh who came in for example uh, uh, uh frank he's asking uh can you tell us, me something about if you start using a new cms what's the impact on recognition by google yeah so anytime i mean obviously seo is a, a very important channel um, search is a very important channel that we have to be mindful of as a way to um, gain visitors onto our site and so the first thing whenever you're thinking about a big systems change a cms change whether it's from wordpress to joomla joomla to drupal drupal to sitecore sitecore to wordpress whatever it is or onto hubspot the first thing to recognize is that there's always going to be some bumps in the roads. There's always going to be um, a dip in SEO. That's just part of the, the nature of the beast. Um, and so there's a number of things that you can do and there's long, longer articles online. I'm sure what webs can advise as well on what you can do to minimize that change. And um, you know, things from keeping URL structures the same to um, making sure you're not doing any totally drastic changes right out of the right out of the box with content kind of a phase one is move technology phase two is build the launch pad site um, you know there are a number of things that you can do to minimize that kind of fluctuation along with pairing it with uh, a SEO campaign so that not only are you making the changes on the site but at the same time you're doing some proactive SEO activities to help mitigate the fluctuations on the site change so that's that's point one the second point, which is specific to the technology CMS Hub, is that we have, um, you know, someone who's been lifelong marketers um, in the marketing world and have built the inbound marketing methodology, which SEO is a very core piece of it. SEO and marketing is is why we built the CMS. We didn't build it because we wanted the the coolest tech 
the coolest technology in the world to do crazy headless stuff that, you know, developers nerd out about. We built it for marketers to do marketing and generate leads and growth for the business. So SEO is very important. We specifically wanted to make sure that it was very easy coming onto our site uh, or coming onto our CMS to win, to think mobile first. We know that mobile is a very key, if not one of the key, one of the top three factors that Google looks at. And so out of the box, all the themes, all the um, uh, um, websites that are built on HubSpot are responsive right out of the box. And the system is made so that it helps you build those responsive websites without having to put in a ton of time and energy uh, above and beyond what is built in the system. Additionally, for all your blogs, those come ready with uh, Google AMP. It's called, it's a framework, it's a mobile framework for displaying content on a mobile site. It's built by Google. And um, it comes, there comes AMP ready right out of the box. It's just a one click turn on. And then from there, all your blogging, all your content in your blog uh, will automatically become uh, AMP friendly, which gets prioritized in terms of how Google indexes it. Uh, we also have speed and speed and reliability. So of course, you know, just like any CMS, um, you want to be thinking about speed um, and performance in terms of SEO impact. You know, they're always looking for quick load speeds. Part one of that is how your developers build on top of the CMS. That's my little asterisk is you gotta be working with good developers who understand how to code with best practices. Folks that again, web, webs have and can advise on. But uh, in addition, you need a good solid platform. So that's where the CDN comes in. That's where the performance monitoring comes in. Um, we've worked really, really hard to prioritize speed in the platform uh, overall. And, we can send some resources out on, on where to learn more of what we're doing there. Um, cool. Along with the SEO recommendations tools and so on and so forth, there's plenty on yeah. there, but um, you know, it's something that we are very top of mind. Yeah, it's amazing. And uh, Francis has a good question. Uh, I know you started a, a, a very cool journey with this project on developing that CMS, but um, yeah, if you be like devil's advocate, like is there anything you would optimize like today, which is not optimized? Enough. Um, my guess is that we're talking about the CMS hub specifically um, versus just CMSs in general. If that's not the case, you can let me know in the chat pane. But um, I mean, the CMS hub has gone, again, like those core foundational things that we talked about, SaaS CMS, enabling your marketers, um, being a giving, allowing personalized experiences and re showing return on investment. Those are the core pillars that we built the CMS to solve. And we feel, of course, we it's a never ending journey, just like your website. We're always improving it. We got over a hundred product team members on my team working on improving the product itself. I'm coding away right now as we speak. So that will never end. Um, but I do feel like the foundation that we've built there from the, um, the NPS that we get from the customer feedback we get, we've done a really, really good job at those core foundational pieces. Now what we're looking towards for the rest of the year is how do we, um, expand the impact, um, that the website has on the business, make it more scalable, more easier for bigger mid-market companies. So we're looking at um, asset management. How is it easier to collaborate, build, manage assets? How do we uh, think about content distribution by decoupling content from the systems that you can distribute content across different platforms? Things like that where um, you're, you're sort of extending the content that you're building already and making it easier to collaborate. Um, so again, there's, there's yeah. plenty to work on, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah. very happy with the saying. result. Trying to get to the bigger companies. Um, there are a couple of people dropping off right now because it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's the end of the hour as we promised. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Luke, today and explaining uh, about uh, how to generate the best website in order with this cool method of growth-driven design, but especially also with the tooling of HubSpot. As you mentioned in one of your slides, I know you share this cool information with a lot of uh, at a lot of places with a lot of agencies so I saw a, a very well offer of one of our colleagues and that's what we offer all the attendees as well uh, if you would like to have a closer look we can offer you a free consultation on how your website is performing right now and how you could maybe optimize it with HubSpot. Again, you can reach out to Luke if you have any questions, you can reach out to us as well. Um, by saying that, I want to invite everybody for already the 12th episode of Web's Webinars Wednesday next week. And it's about um, um, uh, Bas Wouters who is joining us. He's the only certified Kialdini trainer in the Netherlands. And he wrote a book on 
how to implement the rules of persuasion into a website, into online mm. web design, which is Very cool. quite cool. So if you want to optimize your website and be more persuasive, like Gildini has his methods on, be here next week again, but we will do it in the morning again on the natural Dutch morning time. So Luke, again, it's great that you join us at seven in the morning and um, <laughs> shared your passion. We all loved it, I'm sure. And um, yeah, thank you everybody. I, I, will, I will say that I've had, the, I've had the pleasure of working with webs for a number of years now on website projects, on growth gym design, and um, they do phenomenal work. One of our top partners, top development, very, very smart about how they think about websites. And so uh, I would strongly encourage anyone to take, hey, free advice, free consult, uh, consulting, why not? Yeah. Uh, take advice from them. They'll be able to get, advise you on, uh, on the site. I'm, I'm really happy that you all are offering it because you do very good work. Cool. Thank you. You made us blush, so we have to go right now. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. See you next time. Yes.